Okay, so here we go again. Uh, user interactivity. And uh, I love this quote, nobody knows the trouble we're in. <laughs> and nobody seems to think it all might happen again. Well, it, it does keep happening again and again. And uh, uh, that's the nature of the business, I guess. So, so what we will do is uh, uh, work with that, get past it, and, and go into one of the more interesting, certainly one of the more unique things about X3D compared to other media types. And that's the notion of user interactivity, user interaction. And uh, in fact, here's, uh, here's something unscripted before we go into that is let's go to the mother of all websites, uh, the SIGGRAPH website. And SIGGRAPH, as uh, many of you know, is the special interest group on graphics, the uh, uh, professional society for computer graphics. Well, I would just like to call your attention to something about the charter name of SIGGRAPH, and that's the Special Interest Group on Graphics and Interactive Techniques. Okay, so interaction is front and center in terms of what does SIGGRAPH do what are 3D graphics about? And so this is one of the aspects of 3D that's uh, way cool and very important. Okay, and I guess we can also see while we're here that uh, at the conference a few weeks ago, it included over 28,000 of our best friends. So nice stuff. Okay, so what is this interaction business about? Well, user interactivity is the ability for users to feedback into the scene what they want to do, what they would like to see, what they would like to make happen. Okay, and as authors of X3D scenes, it's up to us to try to maximize the different ways a user could interact could play, could help drive the scenes. Now there's a, there's a close corollary here to user interactivity, and that is our, our, our old favorite saying of, uh, if it ain't moving, it ain't 3D. The reason for that is not just the superficiality of, well, this, the, the changing viewpoint lets you show that there's a geometric shape there, okay? Video also does that. But usually when you're looking at a video, you're sort of like, oh, okay, I'm looking at real objects, but you're not perceiving it as 3D. You're perceiving it as an image. When the user is interacting with the scene, they are driving the camera. Usually they're moving it around. And so a sense of immersion occurs, a sense of presence, that when the user is pushing the scene, the 3D-ness of it, the spatialness of the scene, is in response to their activity. So your brain is snapping into the fact that, aha, this is a 3D object. These are spatial places that we're working with. I am controlling it. I am interacting it. That gets you into a different place visually, into a different place mentally, into a different flow, different workflow, different flow of attention as to how that scene can pertain. Okay? so. It may seem like an afterthought sometimes. It may say, oh yeah, we want to put a little bit here, a little bit there. But we should not forget that interaction is fundamental to what 3D graphics is all about. Okay, given that importance, what techniques, what tools do we have at our disposal? Well, as usual, we've got nodes. We've got a few nodes in the scene graph that are tuned exactly for this. The primary workhorse is touch sensor something that allows us to tell whether a pointing device is over some geometry or not. It lets the user select it. It lets the scene also detect whether or not they're pointing at it. So maybe they haven't selected it, but they've at least indicated some interest in it by putting the mouse over. Then we have a handful of similar, similar sensors 
right here, the plane sensor, cylinder sensor, and sphere sensor are each drag sensors, meaning that we're clicking and dragging, we're selecting and moving objects, trying to push them around. This is a special interaction mode, we sometimes call that a modality, of how are we interacting with the scene. So we'll find that plane sensor, cylinder sensor, sphere sensor, each interpret that pointer motion in a slightly different way to say how can I interpret the user's intent as communicated by their interface device. Okay, finally, the uh, last two pair of nodes are uh, key sensor and string sensor. These let us uh, check the keyboard for, are they pressing a key at a time or are they typing in a string at a time and entering that, okay? So we have different ways of touching, different ways of dragging, and different ways of typing into a scene. And so when we look at these sensors then, where do they fit in the scene graph? Well, often they will fit as either that optional trigger or maybe bypassing completely the time sensor interpolator. They might be uh, a replacement for that and go directly into a target node. Or perhaps they're in the loop some other way. We get to hook them up as makes the best sense for the interaction that we intend with the user. Okay, so that's the big picture for this chapter. Let's look into what else we have. Now, for the specific functionality of these nodes, there are a few nodes that have quite similar, sometimes overlapping, functionality. And in chapter four, we learned about viewing and navigation. Uh, the ABC notes there, anchor, billboard, collision. Well, anchor was how we made geometry selectable, just like a link on a web page. That's a form of user interaction where they get to say, go here to this resource or take me there to that viewpoint. Okay, billboard, well, that's sensing the user's location. It's rotating geometry to match the direction of the user's point of view, sometimes in a 360 degree sense, sometimes just cylindrically around the, the vertical. And then collision is a node that will report if we've touched some sensor, meaning if our camera has come up and our view frustrum has bumped into an object, then a collision event gets sent out. Now that we've completed chapter seven, what to do with events and routing, ah, we have a place to send that event. We can know what to do with it. Okay, so that's how chapter four relates. Chapter 12, a future chapter, is uh, load sensor. The load sensor tells us if we had, say, an image texture or a movie texture, it tells us when it's loaded, when it's finally down and ready to go. Why is that important? Well, if the user is trying to play the video and it's not yet there, that can be pretty frustrating. And they might not say, well, I must patiently wait here for my video to arrive. No, they might say, this is broken. What am I doing here? Get out of So load sensor lets us do things like don't turn on the interface, don't turn on the other act interactivity until everything's ready. Wait until we're fully set up, then say, I will start the entry animation, then I will start pulling you into the kinds of things that I want you to see. We have two other nodes later on, uh, proximity sensor, visibility sensor, they're telling, are we close enough? Is our camera close enough to a spot, spot in the scene? Another would say, can we see it or not? Are we looking in the right direction? Oh, there it is, I can see it. Oh, there it is, and I can't see it anymore. So this combination of sensors lets us hook up our animations, make them sensible. Okay, 
So although we're about to learn a bunch, although there's more to go in chapter 12, it turns out, since chapter 4 at least, we've already been using the notion of interactivity. We've already got part of that in our repertoire of how we do business. So we're going to learn a little more now about how do we hook these things into the event model so we get more than just little uh, animated wind-up toys that do things on their own and instead get objects that can push back or react or change, modify themselves in response to the user's actions. Okay, as you might guess, there are a lot of concepts to cover in this chapter. We want to make sure that we have the vocabulary and the conceptual framework to understand the notes. As usual, once we do have those concepts, the nodes themselves tend to be then very consistent, very uniform and repeatable. Okay, here's a little bit more on just how important is it. Well, we saw from the SIGGRAPH site uh, that their charter, their purpose, if they ask the question, how important is user interaction? I think from SIGGRAPH we see it's as important as 3D itself. 3D graphics and interactive techniques, front and center, right at the top. So what could be more important than that? Mm -hmm. Nothing. It's just, just as big as it could be. Okay, what else can we say about it? Well, first of all, it's more interesting. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, what's the opposite of interesting? Boring. Okay, here's a trick question for you. And please answer this in it from a theoretical perspective. Uh, uh, what's the worst thing in the world? What's the worst thing in the world that you can do to somebody? What's the worst thing in the world that you can do to somebody? Okay, none of those. I can't repeat any of those answers. But how about, what's the worst thing in the world that society can do to somebody? That, say, civilization allows us to do? Jail. 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 What's, what's so hard about jail? It's boring. <laughs> Nothing's happening. You're just locked away. Nothing's it. Nothing. You're... You're just on ice, okay? So it's boring. Well, I would, I would put to you that boring is the worst thing in the world because that's, why they, that's what they do when they put people in jail. And if there's anything worse we could do, we probably would. Okay, so you be the judge yourself, but how bad is boring? Uh, that, that's, that's way down there on the, on the, on the top worst list of of what bad things can you do. So we don't want to be poor. We're the unboring media. We're interactive. We can be as engaging as our imaginations allow. Okay? And a lot of that is up to the author. You know, sure the user can go around and click on this and select that and navigate, but 3D spaces are big. You only have a limited field of view, typically 45 degrees we saw, compared to the whole world all around. So how do we cope with that? We have to build in interactivity from the ground up when we're constructing our scenes. Okay, so when you do that, they tend to be a lot more interesting. People understand them better because the 3D snaps into place, they're driving, they're interacting with it. They get to have insights that you were trying to do in the first place. Okay, so uh, we talked about freedom of navigation, presence, and immersion. Presence is so important, there's a journal, Presence with a capital P, uh, that describes how this stuff works. Okay. We'll look at a little more at this last point here, reactive and declarative. Because the users in charge, our interaction is often user-driven. So we have to think that through. How do we show the user coming into our scene where to go, what's of interest, what is interactable, 
or how do I say that? What can we interact with? Where can we navigate to? And then once there, what can we do with it? Okay, so often there's this two-step dance of making things available, but also making them visible or understandable to the user so that the interaction can occur. So when they say, okay, move this, drag that, go here, do this, do that, then the scene is getting very responsive. So it is reactive to the user, but it's only reacted to if we show the user what's there. What else can we say about sensors? Well, sensors are event producers. In those animation chains, you will never see a sensor all the way to the right. They are not recipients of event data, except to perhaps turn them on and off. You can enable and disable them. But usually a sensor is sensing something in the scene, something that the user did, or where the user is looking, or some other activity like the passage of time or the loading of a file, and then say, ah, I have detected this condition, now I will produce an event so we can set in that event chain, set in that rippling of, of behaviors to take advantage of it, okay? So the reason we have a repertoire, a set of different sensors is to take advantage of what a user can do. But it's very much in the hands of authors, you folks writing these 3D scenes, to take advantage of that and make it work. Okay, uh, next topic, pointing device. In, in most 3D languages, or most uh, multimedia courses, this slide would have a very different title. It would say, mouse. We don't say mouse, we say pointing device. It may be the same, it might not be the same, as a mouse. Why is that? Because we have designed our scenes for use in any kind of 3D environment. It may not be a desktop computer. It may be a handheld that has or hasn't. Where's my prop there, Jeff? Thanks. Okay, here's a pretty typical cell phone. If we examine this carefully, we'll find a little hole. Yeah, here's the little hole. This is where my stylus lived for about a week <laughs> when I got this phone. How many, how many people have a phone like this uh, with the little hole with an empty stylus? You know? or, or if you're really you know, squared away and you, you pay $29.95 for a pack of three, you occasionally can replace your stylus on here point. That's not a mouse. That's a pointing device. Okay, and so if I have to do it, we can either fat finger, oh, this is interesting, network driver. Is one of you guys installing viruses on my machine? Okay, pay no attention to that process on the screen. Here what we have is, I might fat finger it in, if I want to call somebody and use the slider to get there and maybe find it or the up and down arrows or maybe even get a keyboard recognizer in which case I'll probably take my pen instead of a stylus and and type in characters okay what am I saying different interaction methods this device has a few buttons and it happens to have a touch interaction. Could we put an X3D scene on here and show it and interact with it? Yes. Have people done it? Yes. There are X3D browsers for mobile devices. There's also, go to the other end of the hardware spectrum, you could go up to a cave, a big walk-in immersive device. Typically, they don't have a mouse or a stylus in there, they'll have a laser pointer that, that is in turn sensed where its posture and direction is, not just in 2D coordinates, but in 3D. It'll have buttons for where is it pointing, is it selecting or not. So what we've done in X3D is say, 
we care too much about interaction to prejudge what kind of device the scene is being played on. Instead, we write our X3D scenes so that they could interact across a variety of modalities, a variety of input devices, and you don't have to rewrite your scene. An anchor is still an anchor. A touch sensor is still a touch sensor. And it will work with each of the many devices that the user might encounter when they do that. Okay, so I've got a list of these up here, and uh, there are often more. If you take a VR course or if you work in a lab with VR devices, you find, oh, but wait, there's more is a, is a common theme. Just a, a, a handful of weeks ago, we saw a sunspot device. Ken, do you have a sunspot here with you, perhaps? Let's, let's bring that up. Uh, or Chris? Don't have it here? Okay, we'll bring it in next time. It's, what is it? It's basically a small controller with analog digital input outputs. It also has a 3D spatial sensor in there. Oh, your iPhone has one of those as well. They're networked. They can tell where they are, where they're moving. You can select it. Well, these VR guys down in Brazil took a, a, a sunspot and they were using it as a 3D pointing device, a 3D mouse and driving it around. Uh, do you guys get that ported to XJ 3D? <laughs> Trick question, that's okay. Well, we will get there at all, all things come. Something else we've done is we have uh, ported game controllers. Usually this is which device hooks up to what is something X3D tries to be silent about. We don't want to adjudicate that. We want that to be up to a constantly evolving software hardware marketplace. We want you to write scenes that just work and will last. So can you hook in a game controller, a joystick, other things into XJ3D? Yes, you can. We've done it. They've got web pages out. It does not take rewriting a scene does not take any specialty nodes to say, well, if you got a mouse, do it this way, or if you got something else, do it that way, or the other thing, do it the third way. If you got something I haven't seen before, fall over dead. No. That's how other things do it. In X3D, we just work. Okay, now there's some a few cases, such as I don't even have a pen to use on here, it might be too clumsy, where you don't have any pointing device at all. Okay, or it might be too clumsy, or there might be accessibility issues with certain users where they can't use that device, they're not able or willing to. Well, we do have some good substitutes. The arrow keys, up, down, the enter, there are page up and page down. These are keys we've predefined actions to as defaults that replace most of the common pointing device activities. Okay. And here and there, you still see things, at least today, that are considered quite advanced, eye trackers and other biometric type devices that could be used as inputs. So uh, we like them all. Next concept. Okay, the pointing devices then are used to communicate the user's intent. And that includes uh, direction, of where they're pointing, location of, uh, of where they started, movement while pointing, that can be an indicator of the tasks they want to do, and also selection, the notion of I'm doing more than just pointing but I'm saying yes, I am grabbing onto that thing I'm pointing and this is what I'm interacting with. And if you think about it, boy that's probably very necessary because otherwise, there'd be no way to turn off your pointing device. If you didn't have a selection mode, oh, I am clicking on it, I am hitting the select button, I am grabbing it, then it would be always on. And how do you tell if the mouse direction mattered or not? So usually we're prompted to start an action by a selection. Uh, something else the spec is intentionally silent about is uh, how does the uh, icon change? How does the overlay change? So uh, you'll see different conventions with different browsers. Because this is a, 
uh, highly personalized, highly contentious, or, or maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't say controversial, but um, it's a big part of the look and feel and the interaction that different suites try to provide. We don't legislate that because as soon as you came to some agreement, first of all, it would probably be the least common denominator and maybe the least functional, and second, it would be superseded by the next day because there's always such innovation and specialization in these types of things. So how good is the prompt of your system? Well, check it out and you tell me. Uh, better yet, tell them if you like it or not. Okay, what else do... Uh, what else do sensors do here? Well, a common trait is they react to common civil... Boy, that's a mouth. What, what the heck is that saying? What it says is the sensor acts on the nodes next to it in the scene graph. It doesn't act on all of the nodes everywhere in the scene. It doesn't act on something you might have inlined or used as a prototype or pulled in from somewhere. It just works locally. And so this lets us scope, this lets us constrain where a sensor takes effect. It also means the sensors are very sensitive to scene graph. Yeah, they care where they live in there. And, and if you click on a chair to drag it over and the whole table and the other chairs move, then you would say, oh, you know what? My sensor must be at the wrong place in the scene graph instead of affecting the table and the chairs. I want to move my sensor from up at the top here down to the scene subgraph where it best makes sense. As a result, we find ourselves using grouping nodes a lot. A simple group or maybe a transform or one of the other grouping nodes to separate sensors and their associated geometry so that that functionality is tightly constrained, tightly contained, and not affecting everything everywhere. Okay. Something else that often happens, usually it's one at a time. When we're selecting one thing, we can't select another. Why? Because at least today, devices typically only have one pointing device active at a time. <coughs> Nevertheless, a very active area of work is what's called multiple touch devices. Uh, you've seen some of these things, multi-touch tables. It recently, it's been around for a few years. It's been in the last year that it's finally gotten pretty widely recognized by the uh, iPhone, where you can do things like select with two fingers and stretch or move or things like that. People are seeing the richness of more than a multiple device gesture, <coughs> more than a one device gesture. Okay, so we don't have that yet. Will we have it someday? Yeah, I'm pretty confident. In fact, if you want it today, then uh, I've added this to the slide notes here. I recommend you go check out the uh, Instant Reality browser. They have a, a multi-touch node uh, that's quite dramatic. They've implemented this and tested it. Same code that you can pull down, they've tested with uh, uh, multi-touch tables and screens. In fact, at SIGGRAPH, they've been showing uh, a demo video where they have two people at a big table and the table itself is running instant reality and the two of them, it's, it's got like a pile of photographs on the, on the table display and they're just flipping them around and in and out as fast as they can, multiple, pe two people, four hands, all at once and as fast as they can go, the system's keeping right up and everything's moving with no lag or no perceived jitter. Very cool. So can we get there from here? Yes, there is an existence proof. Will we start defining it for everybody? That depends. Standards wait until things are mature. Right now, this is a very active area. So if you want to play with it, go right ahead. If you want to come up with a second implementation, if you want to organize a workshop, if you want to get people to agree, then let's get it done a few more times, and then when it's ready, we'll bake it in. Okay, so there are concepts that are common to all the sensor field, sensor nodes. Now let's talk about the fields, also known as the attributes of these, these different nodes. And these are the fields that are consistent across them. Okay, so first one is simply enabled. 
can we turn it on? Can we turn it off? Sometimes this makes a lot of sense. Like if we have a light switch, we want to turn on the light or turn it off. But what about when you want the light switch itself to be enabled or disabled? A switch for a switch. Okay, this is where the enabled field really comes in and we could say, as part of our interaction, we might not want to offer everything to the user at once. Maybe we want to have a deliberate progression of what's available, what reacts, what responds to. And that helps guide them into the right sequence of actions, the right uh, activities. Okay. Now, let's say you do have your sensor turned on. Enabled equals true. Please don't forget, you need a route. If you haven't routed the event out of your sensor, it won't go anywhere. And if it doesn't go anywhere, then nothing else in the scene graph changes. And a sensor all by its lonesome flipping state is completely non-evident to anybody at all. Okay. So maybe we have the extra D version of uh, the old question here. Uh, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, if a, a sensor detects that tree falling and we have no route, then the answer is no. You must have a route or you won't hear it. You must have a route or it doesn't work. What else do we get besides enabled? Okay, is active. Output only. That means it's not something we write when we write our file. We can't set is active. It's only set at runtime by the browser. And it's something that we can route out and say, yeah, I'm over, I'm selected, uh, my, my sensor has been activated, the user is using me, I'm interacting, hooray, great. So this is how we tell whether or not our trigger is operating or not. We get an is active, as the name implies, it's a Boolean. It's either true or it's false. Now those values are only sent at specific times as well. The true value is sent when they start and the false value is sent when they stop. Okay, so if you're going to pay attention to a user using a sensor, then you need the is active. Further, you need to keep track of is it true or is it false. Because if you're only detecting whether or not an event was sent, then you'll sort of get a double click phenomenon, a double select that you go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, an event both when they, if it were a mouse, for example, when they click down and also when they click up. Okay, as you saw, the screen just switched when I let go, click down and then up. So for this, tool I'm using, not a 3D tool, just a presentation tool. It is got its own form of an is active sensor, but it would be queuing on the is active false, meaning no longer active. We have let go of it. Okay, interesting stuff. Do you have to do it that way? No, no, you're the author, you're in charge, but now we can figure out we, the way this works. Now, uh, if there's a lot of sequencing in a hurry or if you've got a complex animation chain, that might be a little tricky. Uh, in the past, the answer to that was, well, write a script and that will help you choreograph the activity. We have a better answer now with X3D. We can use our Boolean uh, nodes in the event utilities, chapter nine. And these give us quick ways to say, how do I convert a true to a false? How do I filter out? Uh, say all the true values and only accept the false. How do I trigger a timestamp in response to a Boolean? That type of thing. So very low level, very simple. Help us build sophisticated animation chains where one step leads to another, to another, to another. Row of dominoes, if you will. Okay, another field, uh, very similar to uh, is active but minus the selection and that's the is over field. So that says if the pointer is moving around, if we are doing stuff, do we pay attention to it or not? We might pay no attention to it at all 
until we get on top of our object of interest. And if this has a sensor attached to it that sends an is over, oops, let's get our capitalization right. If that has an is over event, then we could sense then if is over is true, our mouse is over that. Great, is over true. And then when we go off, is over would be false. Okay, so that's how that concept works. It's not just in one node, we see is overs in uh, most of the nodes uh, that implement pointer action. Okay, so uh, use it sparingly because often the, the user's position on the mouse or pointing device can be sort of unintentional until their focus is on something. So the most we might do often is just simply pop up a tool tip to say, if you click me, I will do this. That might be what you use it for. Okay. Uh, what else? Description. This is, I think, uh, maybe the most overlooked field of all, and I love description. Because description means you as an author can put in some words that say, here's what this sensor does. And those words travel all the way to your end user. And it may say something like, click the doorknob to open the door. Which is about 83 times more useful than my little arrow icon turned to a little hand icon. Okay, and it might seem very trivial. And for you, as an author who fully understands what your scene is about and what you're trying to accomplish, well, of course if they put the mouse there, you're gonna open the door. But maybe that's not what they expect. Maybe they expect, oh, I am locking the door, or I am pushing the door rather than pulling the door open, or what is it? Or I didn't wanna know what's I didn't want to open the door. I wanted to know what's behind it before the tiger bites my head off. Okay, description is where you get to send a message into the future to your user saying, here's what's going on. You decide whether to interact now or not. You decide in an informed way. Okay, so that's the good news. The bad news is a lot of people forget about it. Okay, so my grading policy is uh, no credit for nodes that don't have a description field filled in. <laughs> and we're debating whether or not to uh, make this a warning mode in X3D Edit. It is a warning if you convert your X3D scene into Vermal that is built in that conversion tool. There's a number of authoring and usability hints in there. So some of these we might expose through the interface so that you can get prompt, because it's usually not intentional uh, and, and it's sometimes even saying something silly and obvious like click to select. Well, that's always true. Click to select might prompt the user to, oh, okay, I am choosing something from among others. Okay. All right. And uh, further interesting about this is in the specification, at least, we've defined how this can really help accessibility. The ability of people with different capabilities themselves, maybe they're not using a mouse, maybe they're not using a keyboard, maybe they're visually impaired, and you go, well, why would somebody visually impaired use a 3D scene? Well, perhaps for the audio. Or perhaps they can see the shapes and they can, they can move around and they can click things, but they can't read. Or it's hard to read or the language is the wrong human language and they don't read English or they don't read whatever language you've put in there. Okay, so the spec does give options for how browsers might do it. The most common is overlay text. This pops up right next to the mouse to the pointing device and it'll say stuff like, click to open the door, okay? but it might also be in a window border, meaning outside. Maybe, maybe you want their focus of attention 
to be really engaged in the 3D and not have a distracting text there. So you might try to tell your browser, if it supports it, well, I'll put the text out on the outside where it doesn't distract them and they know where to look if they need further detail. It might also be that the browser offers a, an audio prompt. Text-to-speech is not that hard to add anymore. So there are different ways to take advantage of the description. By my, by my count, not many browsers do much with this yet. Still, as authors, we should be aware of the potential here and author our scenes accordingly. Okay, next concept, dragging. Dragging is when, if you were using a mouse, that we click and then drag the mouse. And while we're dragging, while we're moving, while we're still selected, when we're moving again, something will happen. As soon as we let go, we're no longer dragging. We're just moving the pointing device. Okay, so dragging is an explicit mode. And this is called out in one of our node types, drag sensor node type, so that there's some consistency among the different nodes that take advantage of dragging behavior. Okay, so uh, key point, continuous generation of events while the dragging occurs. So that usually means in your scene, not that you're drawing red lines everywhere, but rather depending on the, the sensor, it's outputting values constantly every time the user moves the device. Every time they move it while something is selected that's dragging. An interesting cross check here is that if we look at this definition, I think you can see that we are still device neutral, meaning pointing device neutral, meaning I don't care if you have a mouse or a pen or a laser wand or a touch drag. As long as you've done a selection and your pointing device is moving, you have a drag. Okay, so more good news. Just like selection, dragging is device portable and your 3D scene should be able to go to any one of these devices and be interactable, still don't have a good name for that, I guess, interaction capable. Oh, and specifically what nodes support that? Here they are, the cylinder plane and, uh, oops, uh, let's fix a slide set here. Cylinder, plane, and who's figured it out yet? Sphere sensor. Okay, what else do we do with these devices? Well, we can do 3D three-dimensional control, okay? If you're selecting and dragging, there's an interesting uh, set of limitations here. Uh, we see a scene, we're interacting with it, we say, oh yeah, 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 this is 3D. But there's more to it and less to it at the same time. And if we, the more part is, well, of course we care about X, Y, Z for 3D, but it's also the orientation. The roll, the pitch, and the yaw. Meaning uh, roll would be, if we're, if we're in an aircraft, for example, roll would be the rotation about the nose. The pitch would be the rotation about the side, pitching up and down. And the yaw would be the direction of motion, the course, okay? So we say, oh, okay, it's 3D, but it's really six degrees of freedom. It's our three rotational angles as well as our three positional values. Okay, so there's more, but wait, there's also less. The 
of your race there. There's no, that's, that's the more part, the sixth degree of freedom. The less part is the mouse or the pointing device is typically two degrees of freedom. Okay, well, let's think about that. When we move a mouse on a surface, it's only going left, right, up, forward, backwards from the perspective of the mouse's coordinate system. Okay, left, right, forward, backwards. And same thing for a pen, same thing for a laser pointing at a screen. When we're selecting something, we only have a two degree of freedom ability to control it in those two directions. In fact, an interesting coordinate system unit, if you hadn't heard of it before, does anybody know what the units are for the minimum possible mouse movement in a given direction, forward, backward, left, right? There's a unit for that, right? The, the actual distance could vary depending on your mouse, right? Is it a roller ball? How big is the ball? Is it a laser? Is it some other optical device? Is it sensing position? Yeah, so it's not in millimeters, it's not in centimeters, it's not in inches. It's a, not in pixel, because pixel stands for picture element, so that's a visual thing. This is an ancient computer science history term, but it's still valid. It's called the Mickey. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't make it up, I'm just telling you. But the Mickey is the minimum unit of measure for a given mouse. We don't deal in Mickeys. We don't have to, but whoever's writing a device driver for something would, would be doing that, okay? It, that's all handled at the hardware and maybe the application level, but it does still come down to our pointing devices can only go across two directions. So we go, well, all right, our inputs are two directions and our outputs are six directions or at least six degrees of freedom versus two degrees of freedom, how do we get from two to six? How do we communicate our intent? Because often we don't have a spatial mouse available that knows its posture like an iPhone might, like a sunspot might. Instead, we're simply drawing on the screen or going somewhere. Answer, as with most hard questions, the answer is it depends. It depends which sensor you use. It depends which mapping from two degrees of freedom to six degrees of freedom that you choose, okay? So as it turns out, you can do it, but only two at a time. However, if you're clever about it, those two dimensions could get mapped into six. So for example, if we say we have a cylinder sensor and I select it and drag it, it could rotate about the vertical axis. So my mouse is just doing a left, right, up, down. The up, down might be ignored and the left, right goes into a rotation. We'll see examples for this. If we were a drag sensor, we might select it and go, okay, our X, Y is going to be in the X, Y plane of wherever that is. If it's a sphere sensor, when we select it, then that's going to be interpreted as a rotational angle, either across the vertical or about the horizontal as we rotate it. So in each and every case, in each and every sensor, you'll see this notion of two degrees of freedom getting mapped into six degrees of freedom, the XYZ roll pitch yaw of 3D space, okay? So our, our trick then, then, our challenge as authors can be, can I pick the right sensor for the right job? Can we get the job done in a way that is intuitive to the user? Meaning they don't have to think about it. They don't have to ask about it. They're just selecting and oh, it's going in the way that they might naturally expect. Good challenges to us authors. A lot of common concepts. We spent the whole period today talking about what is it that goes into these nodes.
So nobody knows the trouble we're in, but we're going to see it happen again and again as we go through these nodes. We are going to find the same behavior supply in the slightly different context of each one. And this is building more than our alphabet. This is building our vocabulary of user interaction and how we can embed that, engineer that right into our scenes so that our users are taking full advantage of 3D space, comprehending visually, gut feel, ah, yes, I'm interacting here and I'm doing stuff with 3D you can't do with any other media. Okay, so in our next session, we'll pick right up then, going through these nodes, the touch sensor for selection, the drag sensors to move things around, and then eventually we'll finish up with the keyboard sensors, key for individual key, string for full lines of text entered at the keyboard. See you next time.